All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 2150 Object Orientation. I uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the lights are turned off. The lights are turned off today, uh, and uh, I'm grateful to to someone. I, I don't need to call this person out. I guess don't they don't want to be called out? It was that guy right there. Yeah, he's uh, great. Thank you so much for figuring that out. He hacked into the console, figured out the password. It was a really difficult password to, to figure out. Yeah, it was uh, the username is arms205. The, the password is arms205. Uh, I don't know why it's locked, uh, whatever. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone here, I'm sure, is grateful to be able to see the screen properly. So thank you for that. Um, I also hope that, uh, I, I don't know, I, I've ch I listened to the audio of the recording last from last time, and it was terrible. It was really bad. I was just super blown out. I turned the volume down on my microphone, so hopefully it's better this time. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't hear the recording of myself while I'm doing it, so it's hard to know what's going wrong. All right, uh, so I hope you all had a great weekend. It's been cold, it's been cold, it is so cold. I don't know why it's still so cold in April, but it's, uh, it's not even April yet, it's still March. Today, we're gonna keep talking about JavaScript. Uh, we're gonna keep doing approximately the same thing that we've been doing for the last couple lectures. I wanna spend some time basically working through uh, using JavaScript as a language. We're going to go through the process of uh, figuring out a couple of things that are related to just using JavaScript first. So last class, I very feverishly tried to show you how to change the behavior of array as a class. And I want to just do that properly instead of feverishly at the end. I want to do some multi-file IO, uh, multi-file JavaScript stuff. So like You've been doing multi-file Java for a long time in multi-file C++, so let's take a look at how we do that in JavaScript. And then I want to move on to, uh, to talking about inheritance and classes and um, how in class hierarchies can be created and how even though we can do that in JavaScript, it's, uh, it's a little bit less meaningful than what we're able to do with languages like Java and C++ because of how flexible JavaScript is as a programming language. So, um, so let's get to that. The other thing that I want to show today is uh, I've been running all of my node scripts on the command line as node and then the name of my scripts. Uh, I want to show you how to run them in VS Code too, um, specifically so that you can use the debugging tools in VS Code. Uh, there's a debugger on the command line as well, which I can show, but it's way more painful to use than just using VS Code. It's way more painful to use even than LLDB. And if you don't like LLDB, you really won't like using this um, debugger. So uh, take that for what it's worth. All right, so let's, uh, let's write a little bit more JavaScript. If you've got VS Code installed on your machine, if you've got Node installed on your machine, I welcome you to follow along with what I'm doing. I'm gonna do my best to, uh, to pace myself, to make sure that I'm typing slow, to make sure that I'm explaining what I'm talking about. If I'm going too fast, please just shout at me. Please throw something at me. Please get me to stop, and I will just stop and take a breath and uh, make sure that we're all on the same page with what we're doing. As, uh, as with the last couple classes, the, uh, the structure of this is that I've got lots of slides in the vertical here, and these are primarily for your reference. I'm, I'm going to be doing this mostly in VS Code itself as opposed to stepping through the slides themselves. Uh, so you can use these as a reference tool if you want to take a look at them um, after class, but I'm going to be primarily working in Visual Studio Code. All right, uh, so one thing I learned about um, just this morning, embarrassingly just this morning, is uh, normally what I do for class is I will just change the font size of my editor and then make the font size of just the editor bigger so that you can all see it. But you can actually just zoom in the entire interface of Visual Studio Code. I didn't know that. I had no idea you could do that. So I'm zooming in quite a lot so that the debug tools and the run tools are visible. They're visible to everyone. Uh, and for what it's worth, if you also want to do this on your own, 
you can press control and then the equal sign on your keyboard and that will just expand everything in, uh, in VS Code. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the, the weird stuff that we can do in Java with arrays and changing the class behavior at uh, runtime. JavaScript is a language that gives you a lot of flexibility. It gives you a lot of flexibility in the way that it as a language works and the way that its standard libraries work. One thing that you have the power of being able to do in JavaScript is changing classes that are provided to you. So normally if we're doing something like this in Java, we've got classes that come from the JDK. There's a whole big pile of classes that we get from the JDK. And the only way that we can really change those classes is to extend those classes and then modify their behavior in some way. In JavaScript, you get uh, classes for free. There are classes that come with the language, but we don't have to extend them to change the behavior. We can just change the behavior of the class programmatically. Let's take a look at what this looks like. So I've got this, uh, this sample kind of structured in the way that we're looking for you to structure your JavaScript programs. I've got that use strict string at the very top, and I've got comments here for the different parts that I'm going to put into this program. So imports, uh, functions, classes, and then the main function, the function that we call main, but isn't actually behaving like the main function of uh, a regular uh, programming language like C and C++ and Java. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to declare a new array. I can declare a new array that has 10 elements all undefined using a constructor for the array class. I can do things like make changes to the contents of my array. And I can do things like print out console.log my array. I can print out the contents of this array. I'm going to run this program as it is in JavaScript right now. Normally, when you're in VS Code, you've got the File Explorer button open. You can click on this play and debug, run and debug tool to run a JavaScript program. And if you click run and debug, it will run the program to completion, so it's not debugging anything yet. It will run it to completion. Another way that you can get your program to run and debug in Visual Studio Code is to put your cursor on a line and then right click. Uh, it didn't make these any bigger. It didn't make the menus any bigger, but there's a run to cursor option here. It says run to cursor, and it will just put a breakpoint there, and it will run to that specific line in your code. So if I run to cursor right now, it's going to break on uh, line 13 in my code. And I can kind of see what the state of this array looks like right now. So I can add things to this array. I can do things like I would like to add a new function to this array. I can say things like my array dot print is equal to function, because we can just assign functions to properties of an object. This is just something that we can do. And I can print stuff out. And if I say myArray.print and run this, it just kind of works. Like this is a class that we created an instance of, and we've just added a new property to this thing. That's, that's, that's fine. That's one way to add behavior to a class. Just make a new property and assign a function to it. But you may also want to add behavior of a class that get created using a class that you don't have control over. So I'm going to comment this quickly, add behavior to one instance of a class. I'm going to say here, add behavior to all instances of array. I'm going to spell instances correctly. 
there's a property on classes called prototype. And the prototype is, this is what the class definition is. This is what the class definition is for the language that's been provided to me. I can say this, array.prototype. And I'm going to add a new function here called clear all. Clear all is a function that I want to add to this class. I want to add a new behavior to this class. This doesn't exist on array right now. And I'm going to say it's equal to function. So I'm going to do the same sort of thing that I was doing with my array itself. And I'm going to write a little loop in here. My clear all behavior, I want it to go through the process of setting all values in the array to be undefined. So I'm going to say for let i is equal to 0, i is less than this.length. In the scope of this function, this is the surrounding array instance that we're referring to. And then I'll say i++. I'll put braces around this. And I'll say this just subscript now. So again, we're referring to the array itself that we're modifying. This at i is equal to undefined. Undefined is kind of like null. And if I run this, Nothing's really going to happen because I've added this new behavior to the array class, but I haven't called it yet. I'm going to try calling this function now on my, my instance of array. And then I'm going to say console.log my array. So I'm going to call the new behavior, print out to see if it's changed. So I want to see if it's actually made a change to the internal data model that is this array. I'm going to put my cursor here, and I'm going to right click, and I'm going to run to cursor. I want to debug this now. So I've got my array on the side here. I've got this function print. That's the one that we just added to that instance of this class. I just added this new function to just that instance. So no other arrays have this print functionality. Just this one specific instance have this print because I set it on that specific thing. There are some other things that we can kind of see here, like there's these hidden proto entries in my uh, watch list. There's variables that are part of this class instance that are called proto. And proto is the prototype for this class type itself. By adding this behavior to the prototype, I've added this behavior to all instances of array. So all instances of array now have this uh, clear all functionality. So I'm going to step over this line, clear all. I'm going to scroll up here to see what the values of my array actually are right now. And it, it works. It changes this specific instance of the array, but this is behavior that I've added to all instances of array. So I'm going to, I'm going to run this to completion now. And what I want to see at the end here is, let's create a new instance of array. So I'm going to say let my other array is equal to new array. And I'll put, I don't know, two elements in that for now. And I really just want to see, does this one also have this new behavior that I've added to the prototype for this class? So I'm going to say my other array dot clear all. I'm just going to run that. If it exists, it should, should just complete. There should be no error messages here. We should just get kind of nothing as output because it will have succeeded in running that function. I'm going to run and debug. 
and it works. It runs to completion. So let me step through this. I'm going to scroll back up here. We've declared a new object called myArray. And what we've assigned to that is an instance of the array class. So this creates a new instance of the array class. I've added behavior to just this instance of that class by assigning it this new property that's a function. And I can call that new property like a function. By changing the prototype for the class that's being used to create instances of that object, I'm changing the behavior of all instances of that class. So I can add a new function to the prototype for this class, and now all instances of array after that will have the ability to do this clear all function. And we haven't extended the class. We haven't extended the class. We've just modified what the class's definition is kind of at runtime, which is a little weird. It's not something that we can do in Java tri trivially. We can actually do this in Java, but it's not trivial to do it in Java. I think we can do it in C++, but it's not trivial to do it. Yeah, yes. So. This one right here, yeah. So what this is printing out is uh, line. This is coming from line 31 here. It's printing out my array, and what it's printing out here is there's an array that has 10 elements in it. And uh, I'm not sure why it makes this appear as though it's part of the array, but what this is printing out is that there's a property called print, and there's a that's there's a function that's attached to it. That's what the f is saying. So the value of that print property is a function. I'm going to click on this no debugger. I can't expand it right now because it's not debugging. But yeah, so what that's telling us is that there's just an additional property on the, on the object that has a function attached to it. OK, we're OK with that? Yes, please. Does it work outside of main? So like in other functions? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go after the main function. It won't work before the main function, because it's only going to work after we've made those changes. So if I do something like this, so this is before we call main, I'm going to say array1. It's not imaginative here. And I say new array, array1.clearall as a function, this is going to give us an error because there is no function clear all yet on this class. And it comment this out. But after the main function, if I say array one dot clear all, because the main function, because part of it has made changes to the prototype for array itself, that function exists now and we should be able to have there's no error because we've actually been able to call that behavior. So it's kind of like the scope here is after that code is executed, those changes have been made, and they're kind of around forever until the program ends. Good question. Thank you for that. Any other questions? OK, good, 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 good. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, copying objects now. So in Java, in C++, and C, you kind of have this sense of shallow copy versus deep copy. The shallow copy behavior for uh, JavaScript is approximately the same as what you would expect to see in other languages like Java and C++. So I'm going to add a little bit more here, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to first of all declare a new class. So I'm going to go up to the classes part, and I'm going to say class my class. I'm going to say that this has um, one public property called myVar. 
And I'm going to have one constructor here. We can only have one constructor for a class. It's literally that word constructor. And I'm going to say this dot my var is equal to arguments at element zero. So remember, we've got that arguments array in the scope of a function. So any function that we're calling, no matter how many parameters we've set, we always have access to all, all arguments that were passed in this arguments array. And I'm going to say, I'm going to have a function, a method here attached to this called print. And I'm going to say console.log. Wow, that was very nice. Thank you, BS Code, for fixing that for me. I typed in console as C O S N and it just like inverted it. That's <laughs> that's great. I don't know. That's uh, that's fascinating. Here I am. I've, I'm just like my I, I live almost my entire life in VI. I I don't use VS Code outside of this class. Like like literally outside of this classroom, I don't use VS Code. When I'm trying this stuff out on my own. I do it in VI on the command line. Everything is in VI. Here, I do everything in VI. My whole life is in VI. I, all the lecture notes that I produce are in VI. I use Markdown and I convert them to slides. I write everything in VI. And then I start using VS Code and I misspell things and it fixes it for me. And why am I still using VI? Why do I still do this to myself? In my class, and I'm going to say this dot my var. So we've got a simple instance of a class here, a simple class that we can use to kind of demonstrate this behavior of shallow copy. I'm going to scroll down to my main function now. And I'm going to create a new instance of my class. Demonstrating sh shallow copy in, in uh, JavaScript. And I'm just going to pass that a number. So my var now has a value of 10. I'm going to say let b is equal to a. So remember, the whole idea here is that everything that we've got in JavaScript is just a pointer. It's just a pointer. The actual instance of the object has that metadata attached to it. There's a tag that says, this is what this type is. This is what this actual object's type is. When we do an assignment like this, this is just a shallow copy. So we're just copying that pointer. That's all we're doing. The value for A is just a pointer to an object that is an instance of my class. And B is just the same pointer. They're pointing to the same physical object in memory. So if I do things like b.myvar is equal to 10,000, and I print out both of them, the side effects are that both of them will have been changed. So I'll run this, I'll save it, and I'll run it. The side effect here is that both of them will have been changed. So this is trying to shorten the output here, but it's saying that this was printed out twice. In my class, 10,000 was printed out twice. We're just making changes to the same physical object. We can do deep copy of objects using um, a method that's provided by JavaScript itself. So the language has the ability to do this. I'm going to uh, start with, let's do deep copy of objects. So remember that we can just declare a variable and assign it an object without having it be attached to a class. We can just kind of, in our code, create a new instance of an object without having the template that is the class. I'm going to say, let my object is equal to, and then we use this curly brace notation to say I've got an object that I want to create, and then we use properties here. So I'm going to say property, and I'm going to say that the value here is uh, rubber ducky, and I'm going to have an action that's a function. It takes no arguments. It's just going to print out whatever the property is. 
that we've passed that we have in this uh, in this object. If I want to do a deep copy of this object, I have to create a new object. So I'm going to say let copy is equal to new object. Object is a class type in JavaScript in the same way that it is in Java. We have a class object that we can use. And then there's a static method or a class variable, a class method that we can call on object itself that's called assign. Object.assign has the same backwards set of arguments in my mind. I always expect it to be the other way around, but um, when you're thinking about stir copy, this is what drives me crazy in C. When you're copying strings, the arguments are backwards. I expect it to be like source then target, but it's target then source. I don't know why. Mem copy is the same way. Object.assign here is the same way. So we have to create an instance of an object. We have to create an instance of an object for kind of like as a destination for all the things that we're going to add to it. And then we have to supply what we want it to copy. So creating this instance of this object here is creating a new physical thing in memory somewhere that this copy variable is pointing at. Object.assign will do a deep copy on properties which might be variables or functions. So it's going to copy both things. So this now means that I can do things like my uh, copy dot action, which is the name of the function that we've got there, and it's going to print out rubber ducky. So if I run this, Let me open this up a little bit bigger. Property is not defined. Oh gosh, you know what? I'm supposed to say this dot. There we go, rubber ducky. OK, good. So object.assign gives us the ability to do a deep copy of objects. It gives us the ability to do a deep copy of objects. Let me put this back down a little bit. This is doing a deep copy on objects and properties on objects. We can use this to copy class instances too. We can use this to copy class instances too, but it doesn't work exactly the same way. It doesn't work exactly the same way. So I'm going to be using the same my class as above. And what I'm going to say now is that my object deep copy of class instances with objects.assign behaves slightly differently than with bare objects. So if I say my object is equal to new my class, and then I say I'm going to reassign copy to a new object. I kind of want to reset the world here. I want to get it back into the same state that it was in before. If I say object.assign copy my object, this is going to, to work. Like the, the method call here that I'm making to duplicate the object is going to succeed. I can print out public properties of this class now. So I'm going to print out copy dot my var. And my var up here is something that we're passing into the constructor. My var here has a value of 100. It's going to print out the public property is but we unfortunately can't print. We can't run methods that were attached to this. So let me open this debug console up a little bit more. 
we get that public property. That's that first line that we see there. But when you're copying instances of classes, it doesn't copy the methods. It doesn't copy the methods. It doesn't copy the methods. There's a way that we can duplicate prototypes of instances of classes. But I'm just going to skip that because it's a long-winded way to get to you should just make your own copy function or copy method within a class that you have defined. If you want to do a deep copy, you have to make your own copy method to do that. So I'm going to comment this line out. Object.assign does not copy methods. So that line doesn't work. We have to just make our own uh, copy method. So let's scroll up to the my class definition here. And I'm going to add two things. I'm going to add a private variable, so using that number sign. And I'm going to say this.privateVar is equal to arguments at 1. And I'm going to create a copy method. The copy method is going to create just create a new instance of this class, copy stuff into it, kind of like the copy constructor in C++, and return that instance that I've just created. So I'm going to say let my copy is equal to new my class. I'm going to say my copy dot my var is equal to this dot my var. I could just pass these into the constructor too. That's another way to accomplish that. I'm going to say my copy dot number sign private var is equal to this dot private var. This line looks a little bit weird. It looks a little bit weird because we're referring to private instance variables of another object. But because it's inside the same class, it's, it's OK to, to do that. That's something that we can accomplish. And then the last thing we do is return uh, my copy. So to duplicate something fully, to duplicate a class fully, we just have to provide our own implementation of a copy function. All right, that looks OK. Good, good, OK. Let's, uh, let's move on. And what I want to do is I want to do uh, just a quick sample of multi-file JavaScript. So when I'm talking about multi-file JavaScript, what I'm basically talking about is I want to have a file that has like a data structure implementation in it. And that's the only thing that it does. Is it just has a data structure implementation in it. And then I want to be able to use that in other JavaScript um, files that I've got. So I'm going to go back to my file explorer here. And I'm going to create a new file. And I'm just going to call this, uh, I'm going to call this my class .js. I'm going to make it all lowercase just to be consistent with the other naming that I've got. I'm going to put this to the side here. So I've got two panes open. And I'm just going to collapse that for now. I'm going to create this file that just has that class in it. That's all it's going to be. There's not going to be a main. It's not going to run anything inside the, the file itself. It's just going to have this class definition. I still want to do use strict. I still want to put that at the beginning of this file to make sure that I am still in strict mode. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this whole class definition. Just cut it. Whoops. I'm going to hit Control X on my keyboard, and I'm going to paste it over here. Class definition done. Good. Good. Class definition's finished. The way that we are going to tell the language, tell our interpreter that we would like to be able to use this from other files is that we have to set up an array that's called exports. Exports from a file are the list of things that you want to be able to use in other files from this one. So I would say module.exports is equal to 
And then what I'm going to put in here is the name of the class or the name of the thing that I want to be able to use from outside of this file. So module.exports is equal to my class here says, I want to be able to use this from other uh, files. In the file that I want to be able to use this from, so now this is back in the file that we were using before, I need to import that file. The way that we import things in JavaScript is similar to what we were doing with, uh, with input and output. So we, we say let, I'm going to say uh, my other class is equal to require. So requires that keyword. I want to be able to bring something into this. And what this takes as input is a string. And what I'm going to pass in here is a relative path. So relative means uh, relative to the current directory. So this file called something.js is in the current directory. The dot here says in the current directory, the current directory. And then the slash is the directory separator. I'm going to say my class.js. This is going to allow me to bring in other files. And now, what I've got down here, I'm going to scroll back up just to make sure we've got that require statement there. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom of my main function where we were creating instances of my class here. The let statement is us kind of giving a name to the thing that's been exported by what we're requiring. So at the bottom of my class.js, I'm exporting my class. This is saying, this is the thing that I want other files to be able to use. When we say require at the top here, what we're saying is, I would like to use the things that have been exported by this file. And I want to be able to use the things with this name. So even though it's called my class in that other file, because I've given it this name here, the vari this variable here has this name, my other class, this is how I have to refer to that specific class name. So I'm going to make it an uppercase M uh, to be consistent with the way that I'm naming classes. And I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here. And the places where I'm creating an instance of my class here, I have to create an instance of my, my other class, the same name as the variable that I've assigned um, that require to. I'm going to run this one more time to make sure I haven't mistyped anything here. There's another one in my shallow copy. Oh, thank you. Right here, thank you. Actually, in this case, it's OK for that to be the same because it's still within. Did I miss something? Here, thank you. And it still works. It still behaves exactly the same way as we ex were seeing it work before. The big difference, thank you for, for helping me with that. The big difference is that we've taken that class definition and moved it into its own file. All right. I'm going to scroll up here. I'm just going to stop just for a second. My kids are on spring break right now. And my partner, she's a teacher, so she's also on spring break right now. And I'm constantly getting text messages that are just pictures of them doing really fun things. And uh, as much as I like all of you, I'd much rather be there. Yeah, yeah. So I also went for a bike ride last night because I'm starting to feel really desperate to go bike riding. And it is really icy out. It is really, really icy. Uh, but the forecast is showing positive temperatures. Yeah, the forecast is showing positive temperatures. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, in the next couple of weeks, it will, be, it will be where we want it to be. I don't know. <laughs> OK, um, there's one last thing I want to show you with this setup right now. And the last thing that I want to show you with this setup is uh, raising an exception if you have been passed too many arguments to a function. 
the place that I'm going to do that is um, in this print function for my class. Print is not expecting any arguments. I, I, don't, I don't want any arguments to be passed to this function. And so I want to let you know if you have tried to call this function passing it arguments in a way that I'm not expecting you to. The way that we raise exceptions in JavaScript is the same as it is in Java. It's, it's identical to the way that we're doing it in Java. I'm going to check here to say if arguments dot length is not equal to zero. I don't want any arguments in here. If there are arguments that have been passed to me, I want to raise an exception. Raise an exception if arguments have been passed to print. The way that I raise an, accept in a, an exception in JavaScript is to use throw new exception. It, it looks identical to, to Java. It looks identical to Java. You pass too many arguments. And then if I call print in my main function here, so I'm going to go down to this stuff down here. And I'm going to say my obj dot print. I'm going to pass something to it. And what I'm expecting to get here now is that there's an exception that's raised because I am passing something to this function. And I'm not expecting it to. Exception is not defined. Did I spell it wrong? No, I didn't spell it wrong. Just going to make my own exception. Just going to make my own exception. I'm just going to make my own exception. And I'm going to run it again. And it doesn't do anything now because I've redefined exception. I'm going to bail out of the sample. I'm going to bail out of the sample. It's error, thank you. Oh my gosh. It's right there. It's right there. Why do I keep using VI to do stuff? Why do I keep using VI to do stuff? If I run and debug this now, I still get nothing as output. I'm going to run this on the command line. I'm going to run this on the command line. I'm going to make this bigger so that you can actually see it, because it's tiny right now. So I'm going to say node something.js. There. Throw new exception. Throw new error. You pass too many arguments. You pass too many arguments to this print function, and you weren't supposed to pass anything. OK, cool. I'm going to switch up to here. I'm going to hide the little exclamation point there. JavaScript has inheritance. JavaScript has inheritance. And this is the picture I found when I searched for the word inheritance. A picture of an adult cat giving a child cat a flower in a pot. JavaScript has inheritance. JavaScript does inheritance in approximately the same way that Java does in terms of the syntax that we are going to use to create instances of a class and to create subclasses of a class. I'm going to close these, and I'm going to make some uh, new files for these samples. You know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy this whole thing, and I'm going to paste it, and I'm just going to delete stuff instead of trying to retype all that. Good. That's much faster than me typing all that in. 
OK, uh, I brought some stuff with me to class today. I'm going to switch inputs here to the document camera. Good. I brought some stuff with me to class today. This is important stuff that's in my office all the time. Good, it's on the floor. I brought some stuff with me to class today. If, uh, if you're watching this later, there's a big stack of ducks on the table here. I got a bunch of rubber duckies. I got a bunch of rubber duckies. Uh, these are good programming partners. If you don't have a rubber ducky, you know, just someone to talk to when you're trying to work through something. Uh, teddy bears work just as well. Teddy bears work just as well, or any other kind of stuff that you got at home works just as well for a programming partner when you're just trying to work something through. Let's uh, let's make a little class hierarchy that's got <laughs> rubber duckies in it just for fun. I'm going to create a class hierarchy. I'm going to start by making a class that's called rubber ducky. This class is going to have one private instance variable that's called color. We have a variety of colors here. There's pink and orange and yellow. And I'm going to have a single constructor here. And it's going to take a color as input. I'm going to spell this the proper way with a U. I'm going to say this.color is equal to color. And I'm going to create a subclass of rubber ducky. Rubber ducky does a pretty good job of describing this whole classification of things that we have here. I'm going to call this one uh, Mega Ducky. It's got capacity of uh, something here. You can fit other rubber duckies on its back. So I'm going to call this Mega Ducky. And Mega Ducky extends rubber ducky. So far, this looks like Java. It looks a little bit like Java. We are using that same extends keyword that we were using before. I'm going to start by defining this class, MegaDucky, as having a constructor. I'm going to start by defining it this way, but I'm going to revert that change just to, for a little bit to demonstrate a point. Class MegaDucky extends rubber ducky, and this has a capacity. So it can carry other ducks. And I'm going to accept in the constructor a color and a capacity. And I'm going to say this dot capacity is equal to capacity. And just before that, I'm going to call the super constructor. In JavaScript, just like Java, if you are going to call your super constructor, you must call it in the first line of the constructor. You have to do that. You must do that. So the syntax here for having a class hierarchy is a effectively the same as what we were doing with Java. We use the extends keyword, and we have the super keyword. Classes in JavaScript, we don't have multiple inheritance. We can only have one parent class. We're only allowed to have one parent class at uh, compile time or when this thing starts. I've got another kind of ducky here. I don't think the batteries on this work anymore, but uh, this is a duck that, oh, it quacks and it's got a light in it. So I'm going to call this one uh, light up ducky. This extends rubber ducky. And I'm going to put in this uh, that we have, uh, I don't know, lumens. So like the brightness of the light that's attached to this thing. And I guess the sound that we make is also a private thing. I forgot that that made sounds, and I was delighted when I pressed the button in class. Good, yes. 
I'm not going to define a constructor here, but what I am going to do is in this constructor for rubber ducky, I'm going to write console.log in constructor for rubber ducky. And I'm going to create an instance of light up ducky in my main function. So I'm going to say let uh, lights light show is equal to new light up ducky. And if I run this, I'm going to try running this, but I'm not confident that the clicking run and debug is going to work because it wasn't working before. OK, it does work. Even though LightUpDucky hasn't defined a constructor, because it hasn't defined a constructor, the default constructor that we get from being a class will automatically call our super constructor. When it automatically calls our super constructor, there's no value that's being passed here. The arguments array is empty. So if I print out what the color is here, it's going to be undefined. Color undefined. There's no constructor defined for the light up ducky class. And because there's no constructor, the default constructor just calls super automatically on our behalf. I'm going to change this constructor that we've got in light up ducky. I'm going to add a constructor here. And I'm going to say color, lumens, and sound. And if I don't call my super constructor, so if I just say lumens equals lumens, and this dot sound is equal to sound, if I just do this and I don't call my super constructor, it's an error to not call my super constructor. I, ha I must call my super constructor if I've declared something as this is a class that extends another class. You must call the super constructor in a derived class before you can continue. So I'm going to add that. We must call super constructor. And I'm going to say uh, super color. That will call the super constructor in rubber ducky. And if I run this again, I'm still creating this instance of light show or this instance of light up ducky. It's going to call the super constructor. We didn't pass anything into our constructor here. So I'm going to say, what color is that? Yellow. And I don't even know how to measure lumens. How bright would you say that is? 50? I, I don't know. 50 seems good. 50 seems good. 50 lumens, and the sound that it makes is quack, 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 quack. I'll run this one more time. We're in that super constructor for rubber ducky with yellow. OK, great. Methods in classes are inherited. Methods in classes are inherited in JavaScript. So I'm going to go up to super class rubber ducky. I'm going to delete this line. And I'm going to add a print method. And here I'm going to say console.log in rubber ducky with color. In rubber ducky with color, this.color. And I can call that method on this subclass instance. I can say lightshow.print. Lightshow.print is only going to have what we've defined in the superclass. It has inherited that method that we've got. Instance variables. So I'm going to go back up to my super class here, rubber ducky. Instance variables are not inherited. Instance variables are not inherited. This is a weird thing. This is a really weird, strange thing to think about. Because in Java and C++, we've got 
access modifiers, and we have instance variables, and we create a subclass of something, and it just has those variables. But in JavaScript, instance variables are not inherited. And the reason for this is that instance variables don't technically exist until the class has been constructed. Until the constructor is actually being executed, the instance variables of a class don't exist in this language in JavaScript. Even though we've declared this as private, as a variable that we can use outside of all these methods, it does not exist until the constructor is being invoked. In Java and in C++, when we call new, we have memory allocated for us. And those instance variables exist because there's memory for them. But only until this line of code is executed, only once that line of code is executed does that variable on this class actually exist. It doesn't exist before that. There's no memory that's set aside for this thing. The order of operations here is basically when we call this constructor on the subclass, this is kind of step one. We're calling the constructor on the subclass. In the subclass itself, we're in the constructor, but no properties in this class exist yet. There's no instance variables in the class itself. The first thing that the constructor does for this subclass is call the constructor on the superclass. And so if we go up to the constructor of the superclass, now the JavaScript interpreter is executing this line by line. The first thing that happens in the superclass is that we add a property to this instance of this class that's called color. It didn't exist before. There was nothing for us to inherit. The interpreter, when we run this program, it starts at the top and it works its way down. And when it reads this class, it's reading all of the methods that are attached to this. So we do inherit them. But because the methods aren't executed until we actually start creating instances of these classes, the instance variables don't, don't exist until we actually do that. So once this method has finished, once the constructor has finished, now we've got this instance variable color. And we return to the constructor for light up ducky here. And yes, the class instance now has this variable that's called color, but it's not inherited because it was never there in the first place to inherit. It's only once we've run that code. Once these lines of code execute, now we're adding these properties to an instance of this class. So inheritance here is kind of a little bit different than what we were seeing in. Uh, than what we were seeing in Java and, uh, and C++. Do you use the uh, keys keyword when declaring instance variables? Or... What, what, what keywords do you mean? Oh, like var. Is, yeah. is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah so. Because we're not, if we say let this.color, what that kind of means is that we're saying, I want to create a variable that's called this.color, but it's not referring to this and then the private instance variable color. And because we kind of can't do that, it, like the same kind of rule applies. This would be like asking us to create a variable that's called this.numbersignColor. But yeah, yeah. OK, that's a good question. Thank you. OK. The other thing that, uh, that JavaScript lets us do is that it's kind of a flexible language. And we can make changes to the inheritance structure of classes at runtime. We can change what class, a, oh gosh, we can change the class of an object at runtime. We can change its, in, its parent class at runtime. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say uh, let big duck, big ducky is equal to new mega ducky. So one of these guys here. I'm going to go back up to my mega ducky here. I have color and capacity. So I'm going to say this one is also yellow. 
and its capacity is these ones. It's two. You can fit two duckies on the back of this one. This is creating an instance of, of mega ducky. Mega ducky is a subclass of rubber ducky. I can also do stupid stuff. This is stupid. You shouldn't be able to do this. You shouldn't be able to do this, but you can. I'm going to say mega ducky dot prototype. So this is the same as adding behavior to all of our classes. I'm going to change what the prototype is. I can say that mega ducky dot prototype dot underscore underscore proto underscore underscore. So remember what I said about private variables before, where there's this de facto standard that is, if you prefix it with underscores, that means that you shouldn't be changing it. Variables that are got underscores on both sides mean you really shouldn't be changing it, but you can because it's not actually enforced by the language. I'm going to say that the prototype for this class should be array. What this line is saying is that megaducky is now a subclass of array. Megaducky extends array is what I've just programmatically done here. So what that means is that I can do stuff like big ducky dot push, and I'm going to push a new rubber ducky. And this one is orange. And I'm going to say big ducky dot push. And the other one is, I don't know, what would you call this? Is this pink or magenta? Just pink, 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 pink. It's pink. Array has those methods push. We did not add push to this class before. And now I'm going to change it back. Make a ducky dot prototype dot underscore underscore proto is equal to new rubber ducky. Change it back to have a super class of rubber ducky instead of array like we just had it. Now, if I print this out, I'm going to print out console.log big ducky. I'm going to run this code. And we've got this object now that we can't do anything with. So I'm going to debug this. I'm going to run to cursor here. We've got big ducky that is an instance of mega ducky. It now has these two things inside of it. These are like two indexes that we've got because we had previously made it a subclass of array and then pushed to that array. It has a length of two, but it's also going to have the properties of mega ducky, which have uh, like capacity and stuff after I run this line. Because right now, once I got to this cursor, it's still an instance of array. So now if I change it back, it's an instance of mega ducky again. This is one of those things that, uh, that you can do, but there are not a lot of good reasons to do it. It's more like JavaScript is a forgiving language and it lets you do stuff like that. When we're making extensions of classes, and when we have multiple methods in a class, uh, we can do method overloading and method overriding. Overloading is where we've got like multiple methods with the same name. Overriding is when we have subclasses that have uh, methods with the same name. One of the things that we saw with constructors is that we can only have one constructor, and the only way to do overloading with 
constructors is to count how many elements are in the arguments array and then change your behavior based on that. The same thing is true with uh, other methods that we have. So I'm going to go back up here to rubber ducky, and I'm going to add another property here called effect. So let's say that we want to have a, a rubber duck that has a color that is, you know, pink, but it flashes other colors. I, I don't know. Rubber ducks, right? I'm going to add a new method here that is called set color. So I'm using that syntax that lets me have a setter so I can do assignment onto this thing if I want to. And what I'm going to say is switch arguments.length. And I'm going to ask, is it equal to 2? And if it's equal to 2, then I want to say this.effect is equal to arguments at 1. So if I pass it two arguments, I want to set that, that second argument to be the effect. If case is one, and I'm omitting break intentionally here. Because uh, what happens is we fall through. If we match the first case, it just executes what's in the second case if we don't do a break. The, the purpose of the break is to make sure that you don't execute the next case in the case statement. So I'm omitting break intentionally. We fall through from case 2 to case 1 if case 2 matches. If it's just 1, then I'm going to say this.color is equal to arguments at 0. And then I'm going to break. I don't want to do the default behavior. And the default here is this.color is equal to yellow. So you've called me without passing anything. So I want to have a default uh, argument. OK. Overloading, we have to simulate overloading. I'm just going to change this to color. We have to simulate overloading. We have to simulate overloading ourselves by checking the number of arguments that have been passed to a function. So we have to check how many elements have been passed to a function. We can override functions in subclasses using the same name in the same way that we had before. So I'm going to scroll down to uh, light up ducky, and I'm going to create a new method on this called print. And I'm just going to say console.log. And I'm going to say plus this.lumens. And this.sound. This method, because it has the same name, overrides print in rubber ducky. So the behavior is what we expect it to be. We can do refinement using super in the same way that we were calling the super constructor. So I can still say super.print to get access to the super classes implementation of a function. And then I'm going to do one more thing, I think, uh, and then we're going to call it a day. Actually, I'm going to stop here for a second. Um, one thing that we talked about when we were doing extension in classes in Java and in C++ was this idea of, uh, of covariance and contravariance. So with covariance, remember, we've got a supertype and a subtype. And we've got a method that has the same name, so we're overriding it in a subclass.
but the subclass implementation has a more specific type than the one in the superclass. So we've got object.equals and then other object, and then the subclass we're defining like dot equals, but with the name of that specific subtype. I, uh, I think I'm actually going to leave you with this question. So I am going to say that we've got color, and I'm going to put color and effect. So these are two arguments that I want to pass to this function. I'm ignoring them in the implementation of the function, but they're two parameters that I'm expecting for this class. I'm going to go down to Megaducky here. And in Megaducky, I'm going to define the same method with the same parameters. So I'm going to say color. I'm going to say color and effect. With covariance and contravariance, we're looking at the type. I'm going to refine this. We're looking at the static types of the parameters for the, for the method between the superclass and its subclass. And here's my question. I'm going to open with this next time. Here's my question. Can, can we have covariance or contravariance in JavaScript? I don't want an answer yet. I don't want an answer yet. Hold your thoughts. Think about this for a little bit. Covariance and contravariance were very specifically about the static types that we have on arguments or parameters that are being passed into methods between a superclass and its subclass. I'm going to leave it with that. I will answer this question, though. I will answer this question, but I want you to think about it. This is such a weird picture. This is such a weird little picture. You should, at this point, be able to create and use classes in JavaScript. You should be able to create and use classes in JavaScript. You should be able to write multi-file JavaScript programs. You should be able to create simple class hierarchies in JavaScript at this point. The keywords that we're using for extending classes in JavaScript are almost identical to what we're doing with Java. And we're going to get to this next time. That's it for today. Thank you all for coming out. And I will see you on Thursday. Bye, everyone.